All right. So yeah, I'm here to talk about how we can do more inclusive bias free language in code in configurations and what it means to bring that to product teams. So let me switch over so that my pointer knows where it's at. I know that to talk about this kind of language, we do have to use the words that are hurtful to some of the audience. Many of us have to do this in daily work. So if you're at a point today where you're like, I'm just done, I can't take this anymore, absolutely feel free to reach out later. And I'm happy to give this presentation in other formats and you will get the slides afterwards. So, but I always wanna start with this. This is a safe space and we're gonna talk about the words that we have to eliminate. So I already got a great introduction. Uh, thank you for that, Laura. And, uh, but I wanna just make sure you know um, a little bit more about me and about where I work. So I work at Cisco and I'm a developer experience manager. So um, we do treat docs like code across a large portfolio and um, try to use a lot of Docs's code techniques to keep the language accessible and make sure it's inclusive. So this is just an overview of what we're gonna talk about today. A little bit about the social justice journey at Cisco, how we can go from policy to practice with some of the examples, and then code and config examples using some of the practical tools and then um, resources and happy to answer questions in the time left. So this is a quote from our CEO where we really do have an, a, an, a, an initiative to power an inclusive future for all. And so I bring this up because it does help us with the vision. This work is hard work. This work is tedious work. This work kind of gets overwhelming when you start listing out all the places where these words are used. But I think you always come back to the vision and it's really nice that our leadership has this vision. And our leadership actually has a social justice action office. And so when I've talked to other large companies about where this is being you know, brought from, um, they're actually very interested that it's done from a, a, an inclusion aspect rather than like the IT department is bringing this. Uh, we are part of Social Justice Action 12 so human rights in technology solutions. So there's three parts to that. The one I'm talking about today is inclusive naming, but it's also human rights by design. They go to product teams and talk about where their product might be hurtful. Um, accessibility by design. A lot of us are familiar with that in the documentation areas where can you point a screen reader and get you know, a ability for someone to read the documentation, read the web page with a screen reader. And then, Inclusive language. So what is our charter? Um, we want to make sure that we have a policy in place, that teams know about the policy, that we can implement it and give teams tools. Um, we're trying to drive compliance, but we're trying to be assistive, not punitive. And so we're engaging the community, making sure that teams know how each other, you know, know what each, other, each team has done to tackle this problem. And then, you know, try to work towards governance models. And I think that is the really interesting challenge here. I've worked in open source, governance is very interesting to me. And so it's it's all of this at once, right? Uh, but I wanted to kind of talk about the way this has come about at Cisco. So how do we get from that governance policy? Sure, we picked words to practice, but let's talk about actually picking the words, right? So. End goal, of course, promote and facilitate, replace, you know, we want to replace these harmful words. And for now, um, the, the master slave blacklist, whitelist are the four terms that Cisco has chosen. But if you are looking to start this, um, I highly recommend going to inclusivenaming.org. That is the inclusive naming initiative. And so that's a group that is putting together word lists. So they have tier one and tier two, tier three word lists and some word lists that are no change. So if you are maybe a, a single writer in an organization, you know, like I couldn't even know where to start. Again, highly recommend taking a look at these word lists because you could just start with the tier one and that is, that is your good starting point, right? Now, I would say there's a cautionary measure for this, right? 
um, let's say that you decided to tackle tier one. Well, I really think you should think of these word lists as an API contract. So where we write, you know, REST APIs and say, this is the version which, in which all of these things are true. And we write an open API specification file and we know what breaking changes are. I think that we should do the same with a word list that's a policy. So version locket. So you would have tier one, that is the list of policy we're going after as of you know October, 2022. We would want teams to know that we want you to do that work and have it completed by October of 2023. In October of 23, we could perhaps add one or two more words to the policy. That's kind of how we're thinking of this. And so you're writing down, we will let people know when the words should be changed and make sure that people can have this sort of readiness and, and be aware, yes, we hope to add more words in the future. And that lets people kind of get the muscle memory and get their, get their process in, is, processes in place. So they're good at this. And so that when they want to change a word, they're ready for it. So we're going across these teams, these product teams, and we're asking them to do this, but we need to make sure that we know what we mean and define the boundaries. What does this mean for compliance, right? So we're <clears throat> defining with APIs, uh, the user interfaces, command line interfaces, also internal code. Um, log files, output that comes, we have a lot of data that's output from our products, right? So all of that is in the scope for our compliance. And what we are also asking teams to get, do, and this really feels like low hanging fruit, is mitigate and make sure that these words are not creeping back into your code. You don't necessarily have to gate on the terms. But this is also adding to awareness. So that's where you can put these automated checks with linters into your CICD pipeline. And then another area is product documentation. And our teams have done a really good job. But as everyone knows, until the product changes, product documentation can't change that word. So what else we've done with teams is sort of done a categorization exercise so that we all are using the same categories, right? So first category is these variable names. That is, you know, anytime you're using code, of course you're using variables, it's much more efficient. And so maybe there's also comments that have these terms, right? These aren't really externally visible. And so those are category one. Teams that make a plan, perhaps they're gonna, you know, have a justification for when, for timing, for how they're gonna handle category one. Category two, this is when you're getting into the actual configuration files, perhaps, um, the command line interfaces and the API. And they, when you do this, they do have to deprecate the old use and create a new one. So maybe for one release, there's a text alias and both words work. And so because this is customer facing, new and old must work and you have to communicate it. That is very important work that you share across teams so that everyone's being consistent and maybe even picking the same alias names while they're doing this transition. Then there's the category three. That is the output that comes, right? You can oftentimes think of this as a Band-Aid ripoff. Um, I have an example of that where it's output. Yes, if someone had written a script and was looking for a term in the output JSON from the API, you could just support old and new. And you just wouldn't break your customer who's writing against some JSON that's coming from the API as a response. So you can just cut over. And then of course the documentation changes, you can do simple changes. I think especially in the case of say master slave that's used in architecture diagrams where it's not used in the product, but it's in an architecture diagram, just change that, use new terms, modernize those architecture diagrams. But if you have to document a CLI, of course, it has to follow what the product version, what the version of the product has. So this is what teams are using to kind of talk about the same areas when they build a plan. What we ask teams to do when they build a plan, and this was our first request, was please, your first part of the plan is just to get an inventory of your terms. In, inventory and audit, anyone who's worked in content a long time knows that can be complicated. And so I started doing it just in our GitHub repos, right? 
this is the kind of thing that I found in a search for slave. And at first glance, you know, um, I'm going to try to categorize this. This is category one, probably. It turns out that what I'm finding is in some of this, um, this is actually tracing all the way back to an open source standard. These are Yang models that um, are used in the networking industry to describe network devices. So while it is category one, the place I'm going to have to change it is not just in this code comment, but it's actually going to have to go to that standards body and say, what is your plan for changing this? So there is interesting work beyond just the categorization. Now, what I wanted to talk through as well is how to take an inventory. So at Cisco, we've built this tool. It's Python based, but it's basically how to take an inventory. And I was really excited to see Art do the, uh, the uh, example of getting a getting a Python access token. And um, you know, I'm not brave enough to just do this on my own. So uh, I do not you know, try to run demos live. So this is a recording. I uh, will narrate it on my own, but wanted to just walk through pretty simple, how does this work? <clears throat> so if you did go to the repo, you could clone it. And then the readme file really does have that straightforward, what do you do with this once you come to the repo? So you need a configuration file, but first to even enter anything into that configuration file, you're going to go get your GitHub personal access token. And so if you've not done that before, you know, first we're going to open up that config pi and copy and paste in what you want to put in there. I found it in the repo itself. Well, yeah, in the readme example. So there's a fake one in there going to paste it in. Now we're going to go get our token. You go to your avatar, go to settings, developer settings, personal access tokens, generate a new one. And this is very important. All of this inventory work can be done with a read only token. You're not doing anything sort of scary or dangerous here. Um, you can also set it to expire and I feel more confident in this. I'm not writing to repos. I really could just do read only token. And this one's already expired. So, you know, not a big deal. I think in this case, I didn't be super careful about getting a read only token, but that is important. Um, especially, I know administrators are very nervous about giving out tokens that can do an entire inventory on an org. And I get it. I'm an org administrator on a very large org. But read-only tokens, I think, should be fairly accessible to most people. Now, in this case, I'm just doing an inventory against a very small org. But let's take a look at what it looks like. So now that I have my config.py, I'm going to make a virtual environment. And I should probably check and see if there's any questions while I'm going through this. It's exciting to see the little highs. Hello, good to see you too. <laughs> so if you're not familiar with virtual environments, for Python, it just lets you have this nice little place where you're working and you're not messing with the stuff that's already installed on your system, right? So that's the idea between, behind like, I'm gonna activate this virtual environment and then in that virtual environment, only install the stuff that this script needs keeps your rest of your environment clean, and I have everything I need to run this script. So that this one doesn't have a very heavy requirements list, doesn't take long to install. And then I'm just going to run this search, um, this search script. I'm going to run the script. It'll prompt. It'll prompt saying, what, search, what word are you going to look for? What type of file are you looking within? And then it'll output what output comma comma separated version right so this is what i can now put into a large <laughs> excel sheet so that's the idea behind all of it is okay i get a bunch to my output and now i have a whole bunch of inventory to work with right so with this i now get it into my cell and with the excel I don't know about you all, but this makes me happy. I have a way to sort. I have a way to look at what types of files it is. 
I have a way to um, figure out, well, how can I track down the person who owns this repo and start to get into the, the actual work, right? Once you have an inventory, anything's possible because you can start to talk to the people that you need to talk to. Now, I wanted to make sure I got to the API example. This is what a team had to do. And again, it was re response JSON. So before the name had, was master device, they changed it to control device. And in the release notes were very clear. This happened in version 7.1. In version 7.0, your scripts should look for master device. In version 7.1, they should look for control device. And this can be where it is a rip the Band-Aid off, right? So I'm just making sure that everyone kind of sees this. It's a category two example, but it's returned JSON. So it is kind of in that category three probably as well. Um, I don't know whether I have until the top of the hour, Laura. More actually, um, quarter past. Okay, great. I will keep going. Now, another example is a piece of interactive documentation that we have where we were using examples that used master branch with Git. And so I'm sure everyone who's doing Docs' code working within GitHub knows that um, Microsoft and GitHub was pretty advanced in this and said, in December of 2020, we will default to using the main branch in all newly created uh, repos. So I went through our entire course. This was no small effort, but in my inventory, I found there were examples of master in our course and I went through. And the interesting thing about this exercise was that it wasn't just in the content. It was also in the Docker file had to be completely upgraded because it was all interactive documentation. Um, it turned out I had to upgrade the um, version of Git so that I wouldn't have to run that extra command to make it configure to do git init main branch um, first. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll upgrade git. And then I'm like, oh, that also means Python upgrades. There were these cascading um, upgrades that had to happen once I started going. But it's, it, it's totally worth the effort, but just be aware, sometimes there's gonna be unintended side effects that you're still gonna have to take care of. This is a category four example, but like I say, it was a little tricky because I actually had to get into container work as well. Now, I also wanted to talk about linters. This is the Alex linter. It's open source and super useful while you're authoring. It actually says, you know, master may be insensitive and can give fixes. So I like to make people aware of this. We're also using it at Cisco because it's open source where we're inserting it into some of our internal tooling as well. We have an API linter now that we're gonna be um, releasing to open source. So it actually helps with linting OAS files. So it can actually do um, inclusive language linting on the OAS file and flag the, these terms based on the policy. We used our policy, you could, you know, you could substitute out any policy, uh, but it's try just trying to find ways to get this, we call it mitigation, but it's basically find ways to get this spread across multiple tooling, not just while you're authoring, but perhaps while you're linting in other areas. And that's what we're doing over here. What we're doing at Cisco is sharing this policy file in a YAML format. This one is actually for the woke linter. Uh, I think in uh, one of the one of the write the doc slacks, everybody was like, ew, woke. I don't know if I like that, but it's another open source linter, and we had this one just as a YAML file that we could start with. And this is what's also available in the um, open source repo that we're sharing with the inventory tool. So if you also just wanted a policy file to start with, with those four words, this one's available. And then this is just an example of a Jenkins job that they wrote that is only, you know, running this inclusive lint and all it's doing right now is gating. It is again meant to be in, it meant to be assistive, not punitive. It's not gating yet. Now, looking forward, there are a lot of terms that we want to add. There are more terms in the tier one list um, on the inclusive naming initiative website, but we don't 
feel like yet we have terms that are critical enough to change or how do we know how much it would cost to change all of those, right? So I still think we're doing a lot of work around that governance structure. We really need to know what could we use to justify that company-wide change in code. And I really want to have us move beyond this very US centric and North America centric background um, words. What is it that we could do to set up a framework so that this could be done in non-English languages and for non-English and non-North American cultures? So we want to build an intake form and I've talked to other companies that have done this um, that you could take in words given by an employee at Cisco with their suggested alternative terms. And then um, the next thing that we're doing, which I think is really, um, really innovative and clever. And again, these, there are other companies doing this is we're not just keeping that word list and that intake process and the suggested terms just to the linguists. So we're not just keeping that in the documentation teams or in the marketing teams or in the, you know, people who talk to the press, right? Not just communication teams. We are taking those terms to our employee resource organizations. So we call them employee resource organizations or EROs at Cisco. But what that is, is black connected professionals. That is our Native American or Native Indian groups. That is our um, WISE, which is um, women in science and engineering. So we take these terms to those groups and we say, are these terms hurtful to you? What do you think are the correct replacements? And is this the right explanation for that replacement? And I think that is the meaningful work that gets outside of just, I want it to be correct or I want it to be the right term, but it actually gets to the heart of we are helping people where this language has hurt in the past and we're fixing that and we're doing it in the way that they think is the correct way forward. I also have to say though, as a woman in tech, you never want to assign work to the people who are being, being put down by the system. So you do have to be careful with that. But in our case, um, we've done outreach to more than half of our employee resource organizations. And so far they have been very happy to help and very eager to get the, get the words right and get the explanations right. And then I talked about scale. We um, have a team of about six of us who are doing this as kind of a side hustle, I'd say. Um, and because we started doing this um, as, you know, going to the engineering teams and because it is a, a policy from our executive leadership team that it must be done, we did end up getting funding for five years from the Social Justice Actions Office. So we do have a full-time program manager who's working on this and then just keeps working with all of the different teams and keeps our side hustle projects going as well. So the next slide is the resources. So these are the things I mentioned, which is that list of words that you could use for tier one, tier two. And I think another really important aspect to what they're, the work they're doing there is some words don't have to be changed and here's why. And I think that's important work as well. And then um, Cisco's public policy is put on our, our website. So I think that's important as well to just make sure that the rest of the world knows we are doing this work. Um, you, you might get naysayers and you might get some pushback. I wrote a blog post and one of the comments was, why is Cisco spending my money this way? So you can find that as a reaction to some of this stuff. So, you know, I think that is an interesting reaction and we want to open a dialogue and find out more about what matters to customers in this area. So, and then the QR code, uh, because Art was so clever with this, I went in and did the same thing is a link to the um, inventory tools and the example rule set in that GitHub repository. And um, right now it does inventory on GitHub, public GitHub. It can now do inventory on enterprise GitHub, again, with the right access token. And I just had someone reach out yesterday asking um, for support on Bitbucket. And it looks like that would be fairly 
um, straightforward. I'm not going to say easy. None of this is easy, uh, but it would be straightforward to uh, do something similar with the Bitbucket SDK, where uh, you could look at the Python code, kind of understand what it's doing to uh, look for the repos and pull in the relevant data and put it into this um, comma separated values format. So I wanted to kind of send out, what can I do? I know a lot of this does sound overwhelming, especially when you start to take an inventory, but I do think that's probably where you wanna start just to get the size of it, just to get your head wrapped around how much of this is there? And you know, look at the code, look at the telemetry, look at the data coming out of it, and be on the lookout for you know things that are third party, but that you may still be able to influence. Can you get to standards bodies, find out their governance model, and you know work with them to get their wording changed as well? We have had good reaction when we've reached out. So I do also in working in this area, I have been a lot more conscious of my own language. And I've also finding tools that assist in that. So I don't know if you know this, but in PowerPoint, there is a way to do a run through of your own talk. And if you turn on the microphone so that PowerPoint can listen to you while you do your practice, it can do a coaching session. Well, in fact, if you use the term you guys in your coach in your session, it will flag it. And that is a term and that is a phrase I've been trying to eliminate just as one that uh, I, I kind of find annoying because I'm not a guy, right? So I think it is important to, you know, reflect on how I talk. And I think it is important to discover what tools there are available to help you um, with your own language use and checking it, correct? So I also just challenge you to think about your unique skills. Um, a lot of us are close to API docs. Um, and like I said, we put a linter into uh, a, an inclusive language um, piece into a linter we were using. So what can you do in this role? Who could you reach out to? Uh, maybe it's a, a pro program manager. Maybe it's a project manager that you're close with and just ask if they would consider it. And then we also discovered that the Linux Foundation has um, this really great set of training and they recommend it now for any of the Linux Foundation conferences that you go to but it is um, on you know, a lot of tips on inclusive speaking. I learned from it, I highly recommend it. I have not done the inclusive open source practices one yet, but uh, my colleague in our inclusive language team recommends it. So that's another one I recommend. And with that, I will turn it over to QA. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> I think we are all uh, at the moment being amazed. <laughs> very grateful uh this was a lot of work to put it together and i thank you for making it so so actionable for everyone um janet is saying uh that she found a tool that wasn't for her but it might be helpful to others that's witty.works yes and um and someone in the inclusive naming initiative um wants to integrate that into the um the the um, inventory tool and also do an example policy file for witty works mm -hmm. so um, that that's definitely one that's um, I need to add as you know besides woke besides Alex I believe witty works is in that mix as well mm -hmm. and then there's a question from Adam how do you filter out irrelevant or fake results if there are any mm -hmm. this is a good question so in the world of open source linters I really do believe it is doing parsing, right? It is looking character by character. There may be some that are getting into natural language processing that is more advanced and maybe even AI to do this work. Um, but I think that there are there are really, really powerful enterprise grade tools like Acrolinks that are doubling and tripling down on this. And I am just really impressed with the way they are approaching this, the way they document how it works and the way they are carefully considering how to do code scanning across really large, um, really large enterprise um, orgs. So Acrolinks, I definitely think you could take a look at uh, because they are 
doing that natural language processing where they can detect the difference between I have a master's degree, I have mastery over something and a master slave um, architecture diagram. So it can detect the difference in I don't intend to give, you know, I don't intend to eliminate the use of master's degree. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe your company does, but you know, you can get that, um, that distinct difference and uh, where one is irrelevant to your policy and the other is compliance with the policy. So um, I hope that answers it, Adam, if that's what you meant. Um, is there a echo to this in your onboarding? An echo? What do you mean? So when um, you do this work and all the um, introspection for this mm -hmm. and, and, and the research, mm -hmm. and um, that means that you have a very overarching and, and fine-tuned understanding of what this change also in people's attitude is needed or how you use the language that you use habitually. So when somebody comes into Cisco to be able to answer those policies, um, how do you find the balance and what are you currently doing uh, for this also to not to be punitive or you can't, um, but more like an easy way to absorb this? Right. There, I do think that as I do this work, I am learning better responses. Um, I, I think we don't have all the answers though. Um, so, but we do have a weekly meeting where we share maybe one example where um, you, you notice someone using language that um, was exclusionary and we kind of coach each other through how would you approach this? If it's in a large meeting, do it privately. You know, if it's um, something that you noticed in this, um, one of them was in like their neighborhood board meeting, <laughs> right? So in different contexts, how might you bring it up? But I, I think it's, um, you do have to get uncomfortable and be okay with that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's what you're alluding to, but um, I, I think you, you do learn as you go. Mm -hmm. So it's not part of day one that you, uh, you shared a list of forbidden words, I assume. Right. <laughs> and I, I mean, those were, honestly, the policy was put in place in 2020 mm -hmm. and we're behind. So I think we're also very, um, I think we can be honest about this is where we are. You know, we have tracking. I do like even reporting up I don't think we're far ahead. Now, within Cisco, there are teams that are way ahead in doing the work and getting it done. Uh, but I, I do think it's um, it can vary team to team. I don't see many more questions coming up, probably because your presentation was just so amazing, whole, oh, and so much to learn. <laughs> um, Can you also maybe point, uh, maybe not right from the top of your head. Um, so if somebody thinks, so what can I do in my position? And then you realize either I'm swamped with work or um, I am not in a position to um, um, volunteer to have double the work. Um, pointers on how to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations that you just mentioned. How do you even go in there? If you're not comfortable with becoming uncomfortable, but you know you need to step yeah. in and engage. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I'm familiar with the MBC community, but that sometimes is very alien language for like software developers. Yeah. We, we talk about this um, from the standpoint of what is your personal style? So um, recently uh, a team member got a new manager he very often says, man, bro, do you get me? There's just a lot of that language. Her personal style is very humorous. So that's how she approached it, right? 
Um, and I, a lot of these examples I'm kind of giving more as like um, verbal interaction, right? But I think there's also just the case where we have had, um, after we've given presentations at these employee resource groups, um, we have had people reach out who are project managers and just said, what can I do in my role? And so then it's also about connecting to people who are doing the work. So and I'm giving kind of big company examples, but a lot of times if you just start asking around, there could be other people interested. So yes, you don't have time to do the work, but you could find out who is doing the work and if they had things you could help with. It's not something to take on by yourself. It's not, you know, you can't climb this hill. You absolutely have to find others to help with it. But I do think asking around is a good start. And that's honestly grassroots effort is how it started at Cisco um, and literally like started a little WebEx room, people asking each other until it finally spread out to the comms people who could help. And then it got to me and um, our senior director leader where she and I started going around engineering teams. I'm in developer experience. We talk to all the engineering teams. So I do think it's find, it's find the threads you can pull on. And it is, it is influence without authority. Um, for where I said I'm very used to doing that, developer experience is a lot of that. So, you know, that is kind of the lens you want to look through is I I may not be able to do a lot from where I sit, but once I start asking, I might find out what's happening in my org. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, yeah, that's a thing. So okay. um, you go, then I don't. Yeah, don't how, how do you explain the need to implement these changes to people developers who come from different cultural backgrounds and te treat these terms as technical jargon that has no secondary harm harmful connotation? That is very common. And I think, um, especially in other um, countries, and that's what I was mentioning is in other countries, they're like, hey, you know, slave trading is your background and your history. Why do I have to fix it in our code? Um, and so I, there are there are ways that it's like, you know, this is what we have chosen at Cisco and we have the ability to say our, our ELT has chosen this. So, you know, I think in our case, it's policy and we have a good leg like, to stand on there. But I do think it's part of modernizing language is one area you could go through and just say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, start talking about the gender changing um, that that technical documentation did. You could even point to like the Sun Microsystems style guide. I think they started doing the instead of using he slash she um, to they. I just feel like it's 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 more modern. Um, we'll be will be behind compared to our peers is a lot of what we can do as well because Microsoft GitHub led the way, you can use that example. Um, and just, you know, say, it, not, it will, not, will not always work to say, well, everybody else is doing it, so should we, right? But I do think you can start looking for those, um, those arguments about, and, and again, not to, be, not to be arguing or oppositional, because I don't think that, I, there's some people you're never gonna get to your, to your point of view. Um, so sometimes you just give up, right? Um, but, we have also had interesting incidents where um, they um, people have brought to us words or phrases that are harmful to their um, culture. And so there's a little bit of maybe bartering or bargaining where you could say, oh, well, you know, I, I realize that you really don't want this word in. Can we find somewhere to work together? So there's also that as well. So maybe that's a silly question. <laughs> do you have to teach your audience? It is not a silly question. Do you have to teach your audience to understand the meaning of non-biased terms? Maybe some people don't, don't aren't familiar with some of them. Um, do they cause any friction? Yes, and um, I think that's where outreach to the employee resource groups have been really helpful. Um, it is interesting. So we have a group for pride for LGBTQ. They, even in their own um, community, there is discussion about certain terms and the replacement terms. So you won't necessarily have agreement even in certain communities on what the education is for a term. Um, uh, an example is queer. Um, so there is some difference in opinion, especially in different generations where you know some feel we took that back Others just think that's not, you know, something to use. 
So there, there are examples that you could use of even the audience isn't comfortable with certain um, explanations of replacements. So, but that is getting into, you know, like very broad um, language use. But again, language is super interesting because language changes over time and language means different things to different people. So um, it's maybe not, it's maybe not friction. I mean, especially in the pride community, um, it's, it's a very friendly community, but it, it is, it does cause discussion, I guess I'd say. And I guess the versioning comes in handy here as well. Exactly. To acknowledge that it's a version of. Yep. Each. Yep. For now, for October, 2022. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much again. And it was lovely to see you on the stage here again. Thank you.